You're listening to Big World Network. Bloodshot Buck, Episode 9, written by W. H. Wood and Mitch K. Allen, read by Willow Wood. Nenny clenched her hands on the armrests of her chair. At the front of the room, Hara stood before a large vid screen, firm and overflowing with authority. Arms braced behind her back, chin aloft, blue eyes seeing everything in the small auditorium. Nenny almost admired the way Hara believed in every word coming out of her mouth. This is your final test as justices, Hara said to the twenty marines staring up at her. I want every one of you to come back as justicates, but we ain't had a full class succeed. Not yet. Training on Earth is tough. Civilians are gonna be a constant hazard. Gravity is stronger. Some mech suits are gonna make you feel less like bulletproof ballerinas and more like tank shells. The room chuckled. Even Hara's lips quirked. Open the envelopes I gave y'all as you entered the room. Inside is your potential posting if you pass the final course. If you fail, your ass is man again. Another laugh. I wouldn't mind that, ma'am, cried a justice from the second row. Hara placed her hands on her hips and nodded to him. Unless you toughen up, son, you'll be smartin' after I'm through with you. She began to pace back and forth. I want no failures, you hear? With trembling fingers, Nenny teased open her envelope. But it doesn't matter what I want. About eight of you is gonna be returning to the synth quarter, Hara went on. By most accounts, eight justices fail, twelve pass. Some of those who pass will remain on Earth, and they will carry out their duties as a justicate on the home world. But those who pass and are sent back here, you won't just be training new babies in our ranks, y'all be preparing for the next level. Behind Nenny's head, she heard a female justice mutter, Guess we know which super synth will be coming back for that. Nenny's cheeks burned. She concentrated harder on unfolding the letter without trembling too much. She skimmed to the bottom of the page, where it read, Postings for Nenny Lohi Prout. Pass. Synth Quarter. Fail. Synth Quarter. The woman behind her was right. The quarter wouldn't let Nenny go now, or ever. Hara's presentation briefing concluded, and they were dismissed. Not you, Prout called Hara, as everyone rose from their seats and shuffled towards the exits. I want a word. Nenny froze midway out of her seat and met Hara's serious gaze. All right, good. Hopefully she wants to pat my hand and say well done. Keeping her panic hidden, Nenny looked to John for support. He'd been next to her the whole time, completely engaged in Hara's talk and bubbling with nervous laughter. Now he looked down at Nenny and shrugged. What? he drawled. Come on, I want to leave. At this, a coldness blanketed her. For the first time, Nenny realised she no longer cared about him. Not one iota. She felt like a black hole, isolated, empty, unapproachable. On their first lecture in this auditorium, he'd gripped her wrist, leant in close and whispered in her ear, if Ozima says yes, yes, one more time, I think I'll throw something. He'd snickered, and smiling, he'd offered Nenny his notebook. Wanna tally down how often he says it? John could have at least retained his sense of humour, useless suck of recycled sewage. Nenny waited by the front row until the room was clear, and Hara pretended to be occupied with her notes. Finally alone together, Hara tucked her folio under one arm and placed herself inches in front of Nenny. Arzuma informed me this morning that you have finally amended your report on the blood traders we caught, Hara said, nodding in approval. Good. 
Nenny swallowed and tried not to step away. She had nothing good to say back, so she focused on keeping her lips shut. Hara narrowed her eyes, but Nenny couldn't even make herself nod in deference. Look, I know you got a history with blood traitors, but we judge them on the spot for efficiency. If we let every murderer and blood dealer into the synth quarter, we might as well be a prison. It's... Nenny stopped herself. It's already a prison. But maybe it wasn't. Maybe it only felt like one to her. Few people were conscripted anymore. Maybe she deserved to be in prison. You may be talented, Prout. Don't call me Prout, she snapped. It's not my name. A dark threat settled across Hara's angular face. Nenny, if you don't get your shit together, the consequences are gonna be severe. You're a synth. You're a goddamn justice. You ain't skipping around in the dark and snatching people from the streets anymore. Do you understand? You have a moral and legal obligation. You can't scrub a slate pure clean, but you can damn well try. Not everyone thinks you're precious. This ain't a threat, Nanny. It's a warning. I saw it in your face. You still feel like you're one of them. No, I don't. The insult stung deep. Hara didn't trust her. No matter what Nenny had sacrificed, suffered, or done to atone for her mistakes, as a freaking child, she would always be a criminal. Prove me wrong, said Hara, because if you don't snap out of it, I will see to it that you do, and you won't like that. The orders are that you pay us. The orders, she repeated from the Brigadier and High Justice themselves. Your biological makeup is your saving grace, but Super Synth or not, you can't fire a gun until you can aim. Are you understanding me? You might be a perfect mutation, but you are not a perfect soldier. Not yet. Her words settled inside Nenny like bruises. Knees shook, lungs compressed. She understood. Nenny was still dispensable. Dismissed. Nenny all but ran from the conference building. She watched the other justices in training disperse across the street, and John's back marching away from her. She had to get out. She couldn't go to Earth. She couldn't be stuck on this rock forever. She couldn't cut herself one more time. And, oh, let's remember to breathe. Breathing is good. Unfolding her envelope, Nenny removed the second piece of paper. It was a list of necessary equipment, documents, and a permission slip for four months' worth of pain medication. The feeling of being a black hole pressed down on her again, and in a trance, Nenny headed towards the practice building, defeated. She went inside and passed through the corridors like a leaf being swept downstream. What was the point in resisting? On the way to the drug counter, someone hissed her name. Nenny! She paused in the middle of the corridor and looked back over her shoulder. Arkadash! She felt a stab of joy at the sight of him. He bounced down the corridor, opened one of the supply room doors, and beckoned for her to follow him. They squeezed inside, shuffling between the narrow shelving. It smelt of dust and darkness, and green emergency lights flickered on along the shelf edging. It illuminated Arkadash's sincere brown eyes and emphasised his looming silhouette. He took hold of her shoulders, grinning. You'll never guess what, he whispered. What? His grip sent tingles throughout her body. You're getting out. I've found a way to get you out. Panic and relief hit her like a crashing frigate. Her knees buckled and she swayed to catch herself on the glowing shelves behind her. Arkadash dragged her up, his hands clumsy. His touch only agitated Nenny even more, and she pushed him away. Tears of hysterical happiness threatened to take over. How? she asked. Major Shing has arranged everything. The dignitary shuttle will be left open in the docking bay. On the night of your escape, one of Xing's most trusted contacts will meet us in the armory. Us? 
No, I thought I'd take a spar weekend and call you later to see how it went. Yes, us. This contact will break us into the docking bay. He'll loop the security cameras, take you to the shuttle, and then fly you to Mars. He'll drop you at a remote Catharian settlement. The storms cut it off from contact quite a lot, but don't stay for long. For the first time, Nanny realized that leaving meant she'd never see Arkadesh again. The tears in her eyes grew hotter, and she took his hands. They were warm and coarse, and he didn't quite know his own strength. Despite his firm touch, Nenny knew she'd never be able to commit it to memory. Catharians aren't exactly fond of our government right now. They won't look for you too hard out of spite, he said, absently stroking his thumbs across her palms. It's your best hope for the moment. Mars. Okay. When do I leave? In four weeks. The dam of tears broke. Fool! She covered her face with her hands, but couldn't suppress the wail in her voice. I leave in two! What? Hush, hush! What's the matter? Arkadash flapped his hands, like resisting the urge to cover her mouth. She took a few deep breaths, but she'd cracked now. What was the point? My training, I'm being shipped to Earth. I won't be back for six months. I can't do it. I can't wait that long. I can't! Arkadash shushed her again, rubbing his hands over his head. Okay, all right. Fine. Shit. Shit. Why shit? Why can't we just change the day? Nanny heard her breathless babbling, but she couldn't let go of this chance. She couldn't. Move it forward. She can arrange it in two weeks. Arkadash's exasperated sigh was not what she wanted to hear, as he passed a hand over his face. Ark, he can handle it. He can't. I know he's a friend, but... He can't because he's on a zip transport to Damus to meet his favorite counselor, Arkadash said. It's a two-week round trip. The plans are set, ready for when he returns. He'll return too late, Nenny cried miserably. Willing the ship to go faster, just turn around and come back. So oh, that's it. I'm going. I'm going right now. I'm just going to get on the trading ship and pretend I'm a box. I'm done. She made to charge out the door, surprised by how serious she was. Arkadash caught her arm and dragged her back. Oh, it's a ship now, is it? Remember what I said about the first cliff, you see? Let's not. Take a deep breath and calm the fuck down. The edge in his tone made her bite down on a retort. His patience was wearing thin. She could feel it by the way he almost twisted her arm off. Embarrassment and a hint of fear heated her cheeks. He'd never lost his temper with her before, and she didn't want to see that happen now. Again, another lance of sadness at the thought of leaving him behind. Believe it or not, he said, they actually employ me, and I need to get back to work. But, he added before she could protest, I'll construct another plan. I'll ping it to Shing. We better pray he gets it and can rearrange the rendezvous from his ship. Arkadash dropped her arm and lumbered out of the room, leaving the door swinging on its hinges. Then he blinked at the empty doorway, pretending she didn't feel a creeping sense of guilt, and followed him out into the corridor. He didn't glance back. He didn't stand tall as he stormed away. She'd hurt him. Dazzed, Nenny trudged off in the opposite direction and unwound her palm on the crumpled slip of paper. Pain meds. Okay, pain meds she could do. Leave pissed off giants until later. He'd forgive her. She'd make it up to him. Get your shit together. Today was a great day. For the first time in two months, Ava didn't ache or feel sick. Staying under bright lights for too long gave rise to headaches and her vision blurred every few minutes, but she could handle this mutiny. She paced outside the training room, waiting for Nenny, and a blue square drone bobbed beside her. It was odd to remember that not all drones had Bite's attitude. Just as Prout has entered the building, it said. Thanks, Gimble. You're welcome, Private Buck. Twenty minutes later, Nenny approached with a weirdly cheerful gait. She looked purposeful, focused. 
Good day, ma'am," said Ava. "You seem happy. Did you get to boss someone around other than me this morning?" And then he paused mid-step, just for a second, and Ava tried not to swear. She couldn't say anything right. Was that a bad joke? Well, it was a bad joke, but she still couldn't figure out what made Nanny laugh and what sucked the fun out of her. No," said Nanny, recovering her smile. "Nothing like that." The training room door released, and Gimble soared inside first. Shifting and spinning his holographic body, he connected himself to the wall. The lights hummed as he adjusted them to the right settings. Nanny went to the locker and took out two visors. She tossed one to Ava. "Take your meds?" she asked. "Yeah." "Good. Today will hurt, but hopefully you'll have fun." Ava activated the gel screen and jammed the visor onto her head. "Great to know. If only I could have fun when I stubbed my toe." That made her laugh. Nanny ordered a virtual setting input, and the room transformed before Ava's eyes. A derelict street at midday. The bright light punched Ava in the face, but she stood her ground. "You've hit static targets," said Nanny. "You've mastered basic firearms. Now hit a moving target. All people in this scenario are enemies. If you are hit, the scenario will restart." You can duck behind virtual cover, but don't try to lean on anything because obviously you'll fall through it. Don't I stick out like a neon beacon? Ava asked. She tugged at her dark crimson T-shirt and navy camo pants. Field craft uniform for synths looked great, but it was only practical on space colonies. They're simulations, Buck. I doubt they know what color you're wearing. Good point. As soon as Nenny backed away towards the edges of the room, the scenario kicked off. A splatter of gunfire ripped up the ground by Ava's feet. With a yell, she dived out the way. Instinct took over, and she expected to catch a hold of the building beside her. She fumbled, felt a tingling as the virtual wall phased through her arm and buckled to the floor. "It's all right," called Nenny. "Get up!" A furious, lifelike man appeared above Ava. He aimed his rifle at her head. Despite knowing it wasn't real, Ava believed she was about to die. She froze, went numb, bones turned to ice. What could she do? The gun fired, and for a second her vision went black. When Ava realized she wasn't dead, she gasped for breath. Fun? Hopefully, I'll have fun. It took all of her strength not to demand that the whole simulation be shut off right then and there. The scenario restarted. The same spray of gunfire shot up the street, but this time she was hidden. Trying not to panic, Ava raised onto her knee and depressed the button on top of her left bracer. A thin blade stuck out on the underside. Focusing on her heartbeat, she sliced her palm. As the man reappeared around the corner, rifle aimed at her head. Ava threw out her hand and forced out a ballistic round. It hit him in the chest, and he vanished. Ava blinked, forgetting to release her consciousness from the bullet. It hit the training room wall, and a sharp jolt shot up her arm. Fun my ass. In two hours, Ava died six times, but hit every target. She learned from each death and came to full grips with the power in the palm of her hands. I've never had this kind of control before. This kind of aim. My skills with a rifle may have disintegrated, but does it matter when I can do this? Nanny gave succinct direction throughout. She recognized Ava's mistakes and knew how to guide her out of bad habits. For all of Nanny's odd behaviors, Ava was grateful to have her as a teacher. With fifteen minutes left on the clock, Gimble powered down the simulation. Ava flung off her visor at once and mopped up the sweat dripping down her face. Whew! I never want to see that scenario again," she panted. "You did great," said Nanny. She smiled at Ava fondly. "Your team will be lucky to have you." Her heart thumped harder with pride. "Thanks." It's a shame I can't be on your team. 
Huh, do Justa cuts even have teams? Not really. We tend to work alone unless the odds are against us. Ava nodded and put her visor away. Every step across the room made her tremble. Her head swayed and blood pulsed against skin. Her hands throbbed as if she'd just let go of a welding rod. Fumbling, she took out a tube of skin grow from her pocket. It slipped between her bloody fingers and fell to the floor. Here, soothed Nenny. She took Ava's hands and began to administer the milky gel. When do I start training with the team? Ava asked. You'll train with Gibson and Sterling in four weeks' time. Once I'm gone. Ava grinned. She couldn't wait. The thought of James and Michael fighting by her side, it sent excited shivers up her body. Especially the thought of James being there to watch her back. May I ask something personal? Said Nanny. Sure. Nanny paused a moment, screwing the cap onto the skin grow. Why did you sign up? Ava blanched. Nanny looked too sombre for this to be a test. More like desperate to understand Ava's motives. Well, great life plan, that's why. Regular salary, a guaranteed roof over your head, bills managed for you, pension plan, the whole caboodle. Ava shrugged. Sure, my life is planned out like a road map to nowhere, but I'm fine with that. Nanny shook her head and wound her fingers together. You didn't have to join the synth quarter for that. Why here? What if you change your mind and you don't want your life planned out for you? Bit late now, ain't it? Ava laughed. Her cheer died at the sight of Nenny's false smile. Are you all right? She asked. Yeah, yeah. Nenny gripped Ava's shoulder and gave a firm squeeze. Ava didn't know what else to say. How could she call her superior officer a liar? Nenny's sad smile seemed almost pitying. You're a great synth, Ava. Her stomach flipped at the sound of her name. She hadn't heard it for months. I'm glad I met you, Nenny continued. Yeah, you too. Take care of yourself. I'll... I'll see you next week. Go on, you're dismissed. It was a moment before Ava could drag herself away. It was too soon for final goodbyes, but for the first time she dreaded Nenny's imminent posting to Earth. And now she knew, from talking to other instructors on her course, that she hadn't been trained by any synth, or the boring synth, but by the quarter's only super synth. Whatever Ava's sister thought of the Alliance forces, Ava felt proud, in that moment, to be Nenny Lohi's protégé. Prouder than anything else she'd ever achieved. Listening to Big World Network.